Uh, all right, we're just going to dive right in. Uh, and I might ask you guys some questions. So just yell out the answer. That's, you guys comfortable with that? Yeah. All right. So this series is basically what we're going to be doing is digging in over the next few months, just trying to learn how to read the Bible better. And tonight is an overview, and we'll just look at some basic principles of reading the Bible, and then we'll focus in each of the following months and look at, some, look at uh, uh, things in more detail. So reading the Bible is very similar to reading anything else. How is that? How is it similar to reading anything? What do you have to do when you read? Pay attention. You need your glasses. You, need your glasses. <laughs> you have to make sure that you're reading at the right level. What do I mean by reading at the right level when it comes to the Bible? What do you think I mean? Yeah, understanding and comprehension. So what might help you in understanding and comprehension when it comes to reading the Bible? A dictionary. What else? Even before that. Real basic. What's, a, what's, a, what's really the first decision that you have to make? Make sure it's in your language. And what else? No, that's important. Make sure it's in your language if, if it's available. It is in most. And what else? What? You guys, you guys, most of you speak English. So you have something that a lot of people don't have when it comes to the Bible. Before that, we're talking about the Bible itself. What version? You guys have dozens of versions of the Bible in English, and they're at all different levels. They're all different levels of writing and understanding. And so you can get something that's easier English, that's more difficult English, that's more contemporary English, that's old school English, these and thous. You can get all kinds of versions, and I recommend that you get several, but we'll talk about that. So reading the Bible is similar to reading anything else. You have to pay attention. You have to have it at the right level. You have to, you know, have some degree of understanding and comprehension, and there's lots of tools, which many of you have mentioned already, that are available to help you with that. It's not just a book, the Bible. It's actually a library of books. All different kinds of literature. We'll talk about that as well. And, uh, and written over thousands of years by many different authors. So pay attention when you read. Read it carefully. Don't assume. Don't read carelessly. And above all, don't give up. If at first you don't find yourself understanding, the Bible is something that the more you read it, the better able you will be to read it. The more of it that you read, the more of it you'll understand. The broader you read, the more books of the Bible you read, the more any single book will make sense to you because they interact with each other and they teach you about each other. And so when you read, this is why it really is important for Christians to read a lot in the Old Testament. Because Christians tend to read mostly in the New Testament. That's about Jesus, so I'm going to stick with Jesus. But you can't understand Jesus if you don't know where he came from. Jesus is part of a huge, from the beginning, from before time existed story that the Bible tells you about all through the Old Testament. Jesus is part of that story. And so if you don't know the story that he's part of, that's just like picking up a book and, you know, a 300-page book, you turn to page 269 and start reading. You're not going to know what's really going on. And they start talking about, you know, well, Jack, you know, as, as we know, you know, was, was talking to Cindy, and you, you remember Cindy. Like, no, I don't know Jack, and I don't know Cindy, because I just picked up the book and started near the end. That's basically what you're doing when you only read the New Testament. But we'll talk about that. So I said it's similar. It's similar, but it's not the same as reading any other book. Why is that? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. So it's a book written by God. And it's a book written by God not to inform you. You're like, but I thought it was, you know, telling me more about it. It is telling you about God. It's not to inform you, though. It's to change you. It's not to inform you. It's to transform you. It's to change you into the likeness of God. That's how we were all made. We were all made 
in the image of God. But we busted it by our behavior, by our choices. We kind of tarnish that image so it don't look so nice anymore. And the Bible is written to help us get back to God through Jesus. It's written to help us to become the image that we were always created to be. So we'll talk about that. Not to talk about, huh? That's why we're taking all year to do it. <laughs> okay, so did I? There we go. So uh, I, there might be more weeks than this, I'm not sure, but anyway, what I'll be talking about is this is just an overview. Then we'll be looking at different ways of reading, different, different ways to approach the act of reading. Because you can just like, you know, you can read something, and then you can kind of study something, and you can dig into something, and you can really focus on something, and you can also be changed by something. And we're going to be learning how to do all of that when it comes to the Bible. We'll be learning about how to read according to genre. What's a genre? Well, that's a type of genre, like, but what, what is genre, period? What does that mean? Yeah, it's a style or a type. It's from the French word genre, which means a kind kind of something. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's just a type or a style of writing. And there's all different kinds. Someone mentioned poetry. What is some more? What is some more genre? Pardon? Narrative. narrative. So like, you know, and what's a, what's, a, what's a better name for narrative? Narrative sounds kind of cold. Story. Story. What else? Someone over here? History. What? History. history. Okay, good. History. It, it, see, that's a, I'm downstairs like, history. I'm like, what? History. <laughs> so yeah, history. So um, and songs are a genre. They're in the Bible, as well. All kinds of stuff in there. What, what's I mentioned New Testament? What's the major? There's there's several. What are the major genre in the New Testament? The parables or some letters. That's the major one. Most of the New Testament is in the form of letters. And then there's two more big ones. Apocalyptic, that's Revelation, and well, it's narrative, but, but th th it's a special kind. Gospel, that's its own form of literature, and we'll talk about that as well, but that's its own form, um, and it's a special kind. And we'll be talking about learning how to ask good questions. Why do you need to be able to ask good questions to read? How does that help you understand better? Helps you dig deeper, okay? Now, I want to encourage you, from the get-go, I want to encourage you that when you're asking questions about the Bible, first of all, to ask questions. Write down questions when you read. Whatever questions come to you. And if you're reading and you have no questions, you're not really reading. At least you're not reading the Bible. You can't possibly be reading the Bible and have zero questions. So you should have some, who, who are they talking about? Who wrote it to, who did they write it to? Why, what is he talking about? What's going on here? When did that happen? Who is this person? Melchizedek, where did he come from? All, you should have questions when you're reading the Bible. And so write down questions as you're reading them. They will help you to learn, they'll help you to dig deeper. And I want to encourage you from the get-go, start from right away trying to answer any questions you have from the Bible. Don't jump to a dictionary and a commentary and the internet and who, you know, and, and who's it and what's it and Wikipedia. Don't jump to other sources. Try and get your questions answered from the Bible itself, from the text. This is really important. Most of your questions can be answered from the text, and the ones that can't be answered probably can't be answered. See, I'm serious. So, oh, so what is the baptism for the dead? Well, let me, let me Google that you're not gonna find an answer. You're not gonna find a real answer or a good answer. The, the people that lived shortly after the, the apostles, like you know, during the time of the apostles' grandkids, right? They wrote commentaries and they said, we have no clue what this is. We don't know what they're talking about. The people in Corinth didn't even know and it was about them. So you're not gonna find any answers for some of these things. So find it in the text. And then we'll look at, uh, the text itself, context, research, how to use outside resources appropriately, and we'll learn to see Christ in the entire text, in the entire Bible. So this, is, this overview is tonight. Okay, so this is, this is now, now we're starting 
what we're actually talking about. So for any given passage of text, you open up the Bible, and you either have an assignment, or you're doing a quiet time, or you've chosen something, or you've said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm reading through this book, or I'm reading through the Bible in a year, whatever. However your text gets selected, you have Bible in front of you that you've chosen to read, and you're now starting to read. So the first thing is, read the whole thing wherever practical. Now, you know, sometimes you can't do that. It's like, well, Joey, come on, I'm, 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 I'm studying Jeremiah. I can't read the whole thing. So, but most of the things, like if it's a letter or something like that, read the entire letter. Read the whole thing, read the whole text. Even if you're reading like the Gospels, try and read the whole thing in maybe two sittings, if not one. You can read even the big one, even Luke. You can, you know, you can read through that in one or two. And when I say, you say, well, I don't read that fast. Just read it. This is not the time to be, you know, asking questions, slowing down, saying, what is this, what, what, is, what is this word? We're here, what? Don't do that. Just read it. Just like you would read a novel, a newspaper. Just read it. What, why? What are you doing when you do that? So I, heard, I heard a magic word over here. I didn't see who said it. Context. context. You're getting context. You're getting the whole context. The whole context is the whole book. There's other kinds of context, but when you're reading a passage, the immediate context is the book. And so you want to understand, especially with the letters, read the whole letter. You have to read the whole letter. You, 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 can't, you, you can't be like, you know, dear. Wow, that must be really close relationship. Is this a spouse or a family member? Or maybe it's, a, you don't even, you haven't even read that. Read the whole letter, and then you can go back and figure out what dear means. <laughs> decide, decide what kind of literature, what genre it is that you're reading. Why is that important? Because it will help you better understand. Why? How? Why, why will it help you to understand better if you know what it is that you're reading ahead of time? Yeah, because so the purpose for your reading and the purpose that it was written for makes a big difference. And, and, and also it gives you clues as to how to read it. You read a poem much differently than you read a military report. And you read a song in a very different way than you read an encyclopedia. So it's the same. And remember, the Bible is a library of books. There's all different kinds of literature, all different kinds of genre. And even in the same book, there's different kinds of genre in, in, involved in it. That's on purpose, because the author is trying to evoke different images, feelings, giving you different reasons. The, the, the author might be giving you a report. And then the author is telling you a story. And then the author is reporting a song. And then the author is praying. These are all different genres that you have to read differently. And then, you know, I already talked about questions. And then after you've done all that, now you can go back and you can read more carefully Make sure you answer the questions from the text, and then you can research any specific issues that you might, you know, how much did a shekel weigh anyway? You know, well, you, know you, can, you can look at that kind of stuff later. But it's not important that you know how much a shekel weighs in the first place. It's important that you know that a shekel is either a weight or a volume or has some sort of value. That's it, and most of you know that already, okay? We already talked about genre. Oh, by the way, that's, that's just a small, off the top of my head list. There's, these, there's way more than that. If, if we just did some brainstorming now, y'all could come up with twice as many of, with, uh, uh, as is up there. But th just to give you an idea, all of this is in the Bible. And sometimes, almost all of this can be in a single book. Like, all of this is in Daniel. <laughs> All of it. There's not any thing that's up there that's not in Daniel. Think about that. That's, that's pretty, pretty hefty, which means that you have to pay attention when you read a book like Daniel. Okay. Context. So reading in context, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to read something in context? Well, that, that, that's some of the questions you ask, but yeah, you're looking at at what? I'm just asking in general, what does it mean? What does it mean when you say context? Broad, Broad what? A broad understanding. 
a broad understanding of what? Right. It's just how does this fit into a bigger picture? How, how, how does, what, piece is, what piece am I looking at and how does this fit into the whole? And the whole can be the whole document, like the whole letter or the whole book, or it could be the whole corpus of literature written by this author. So everything that Luke wrote, Luke and Acts, or all the books that John wrote, or it might be in this type of literature. So I'm looking at Revelation as an example of apocalyptic literature, and how does this relate to Ezekiel and Daniel and Ze Zechariah, and, uh, and how, how does this relate? Are there things in those books? This is why you want to do this, right? Are there things in those books that might help me to understand this book? Why, yes. Yes, there are. <laughs> um, there, there's things that, if you read those other books, you'll be things that by the time you get to Revelation, you'll go, oh, it's a revelation, and I actually understand this. This makes sense to me. He's actually telling me something that I can understand. Why? Because Daniel told me how to understand what that vision means. And I read, this, I read it carefully. And John told me exactly what he was talking about. Right after he said, I had this, blah, 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 he told me what the vision meant. I just never paid attention before. So this is why, this is really important. Yes? Okay, bird's eye view, good, exactly. So context, so you want to get a bird's eye view and context is being aware of the whole thing that the bird sees, of the, of the whole picture, so that later you can relate the piece to other parts. But you have to see the whole thing in the first place. So you wanna, you wanna read this, and you wanna be aware and think through what the, context, what the context is, and there's different kinds of context. So if you're reading in the Gospels, right? The, if, if I'm reading the Gospel of John, what are some of the contexts? I'm reading, you know, John, I'm reading John 3 about Jesus' encounter with the teacher of Israel named Nicodemus. What do you want to pay attention to? What is the context for that? Well, you tell me what it's about, but I'm talking about what, what's the... Well, okay, who is Nicodemus? And, and that tells you in the text, in John 3, it tells you that. So I'm talking about outside of chapter 3, what do, what do I want to keep in mind or pay attention to or at some point look at to help me understand John 3? Okay, so these, these are questions that you might have that you can find and you can, you know, you can get more information of. When I say context, remember, remember what context is, right? So what is the bird's eye view that will help me to understand John 3. The rest of John. So the whole book of John, right? And broader, all the other things that John wrote. John wrote five books in the Bible. Three letters, the book of Revelation, and the gospel. Why would that help me? And John, it's really good. Why would it help me to quickly read through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? They're not long, they're really short books. Why would it help me to read through that to understand John's gospel? What, what am I getting? Okay, repetition of what? It's, some of it's repetition of, of, of information or, or details, but more, it's more important than, the, than just the information. I'm getting John's perspective. By reading multiple things that John wrote, I'm learning how John thinks, how John writes. What John's style is like. What John, this is why they think that John wrote those books. And you'll see that. When somebody comes to you, how do you know John really wrote that? You'll be able to confidently tell them why and how people think that because you will have seen it yourself. You say, oh, well, you know, because the style is similar. The vocabulary is similar. The usage of the, of the vocabulary is similar. The way that he works with imagery is very similar. And by looking at how he does that in multiple things, it helps you to understand how he's using language in any one thing, in this case, John 3. Okay? And so when he starts, for John, when he starts saying things like truth, light, uh, uh, birth, these are all important concepts for John that he comes to, these are themes that he goes to again and again. And so reading broadly in John will help you understand John. 
And so you will understand his writing, in this case, John 3. What's the immediate context of John 3? And someone else said, I heard it. John 1. 1, 2, and 4. That's the immediate context. 1, because this is John telling you, this is, this, is, this is what I'm all about. This book is about Jesus. And I want you to, I'll tell you from the, right from the start, exactly who he is. You don't, you don't understand the one who made you, the one who made the world and everything in it, the one through whom Nothing that came to be, nothing that exists, that did not come to exist except through him. He became flesh, walked around among you, wore cross, ate with you, sat next to you, and you didn't even know that that was the author of life sitting next to you. He offered you life. And you said, nah, nah, it's okay. Maybe next time I'll wait. This is, this is, this is John starts how, that's how the gospel starts. And so, you're supposed to know all that. It's supposed to already be in the back of your head. It starts with this thing, this, 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 this word of, of life, this word about the very mind and will and heart of God expressed through which everything was created, became flesh, lived among you. John was not that guy. John bore witness to that guy. John saw who he was. John, when he baptized him, John saw the Holy Spirit alight on him like a dove. John heard the voice from heaven. Not just John, everybody standing there, everybody in the water, everybody nearby heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my son who I love. And then this guy started hanging out and meeting people and talking to people and bringing people and teaching people like these, these fishermen and Nathaniel and Philip and Andrew and these guys start gathering disciples and, and teaching and, and this, this is all in the first chapter. Chapter 2, what happens? Chapter 2, he goes to, it, 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 he went to a wedding. His, his mom was at a wedding. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. And they show up and his mom notices, hey, they've run out of wine. So she taps Jesus on the shoulder and says, son, they've run out of wine. And he says, what are you telling me? What do you expect me to do about it? And she turns to service and she says, do everything he tells you. This is like a good mom, right? I, yeah, 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 okay, Jesus. Do everything he tells you. He's going to tell you what to do. And he tells him, and he, and he does this. This was the first sign John saw of him. This is, this is language again. John does, there's no miracles in John. John doesn't use the word miracle. He uses the word sign. What's the difference between a miracle and a sign? A sign what? A sign to produce faith. A sign to produce faith. What's the word? Yeah, a sign gives you a direction. It points to something. Okay? A miracle is just awesome. That's cool. Wow. That's a miracle, right? Wow. And, and you're supposed to go, wow, God, with a miracle. But a sign, you're supposed to go, wow, God. Like, Jesus. Jesus be God. You, you know, the, the miracle is just like, oh, this guy was sent from God. He's a prophet. Oh, he's awesome. We should listen to what he says because he demonstrated, you know, that he has power from God. But a sign is, who is this? Who, who is this? Who is this guy? That's what a sign does. And that's what John wants you to get. Because John tells you at the end of the book, these, this book was written, why? So that you may believe. I wrote this whole book so that you believe that Jesus is who I said he was in chapter 1. And so this whole book is just building that case that he's, that's who he is. So 
That's chapter 2. Chapter 4. You can look it up. What's chapter 4 about? What, what happens in chapter 4, roughly? Right, right after. Right at the beginning of 4. What's, what's chapter 4 about? And, 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 you know, he's, he's, he's a Messiah, and he's Messiah for not just for the Jews, but bigger than that. It's the whole world, including the Samaritans, for everybody. So in chapter 3, and what happens in chapter 3 after he talks to Nicodemus? conversation, which does not end at verse 16, by the way. But right after this conversation, he, there's something happening. And there's something happening in chapter 2, just before this as well. I'll leave that for you guys, because we have to move on. But this is context. What's happening right after and what's happening before tells you something about what's happening in chapter 3. And it's important. Chapter 3 is leading up to something, and it's coming from something. And you need to have that in your mind when you're reading it so that you understand the importance of it and what it's saying and what it's about. Okay? And then, you know, more stuff, who wrote it to whom, and that's what you were talking about earlier, who wrote to whom, when, where, why, answering all the basic questions, and then what kind of psychological issues, cultural, what, what's going on historically, what are some of the issues that might be going on. This is stuff that you read in the background or you pay attention to in the text. To understand in John, for example, a lot of events happen at important festivals, at Passover, at Hanukkah, or at the Feast of, you know, Feast of Weeks or Feast of Lights. These are these are important Jewish festivals. You might want to, you know, bone up on your Jewish festivals when you're reading John, so you understand, because you're supposed to have that knowledge in your head already when you're reading it, so that when he says Jesus says something or does. Okay, so for example, Hanukkah is also called the Feast of Lights. Right? Remember, this is when you light the menorah and everything, and it was, it was, a, it was to celebrate the rededication of the temple uh, about 100 years before that. Uh, the, the, the temple had been desecrated, and the, the Jews, Jews had a revolt, and they won, and they had a Jewish kingdom that lasted up until just a little bit before, <laughs> before Jesus there. And uh, so when they, when they reopened the temple and rededicated the temple and purified it and everything, Hanukkah is to commemorate that. So it's also known as the Feast of Lights. So it's during this festival that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, does knowing that put any, does that give you any kind of insight, any, does it put any kind of oomph into when Jesus is saying, he's standing there at the temple, talking to people, lighting a big old menorah and everything, he's like, I am the light of the world. You're dedicating this, you know, you're, 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 re, you're, you're commemorating, rededicating the temple. That you don't understand. I'm the living temple of God. I am God in your midst. Me. And he says this over and over and over again in lots of different ways. In chapter 2 he says, that's where he says, if you guys destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. And they start arguing. It took 46 years to build this temple and everything. What are you talking about? This guy crazy and everything. But what was he talking about? I, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. Now, but what, is, what does that mean, though? When he's, he's, first of all, claiming to be the temple and greater than the temple itself, but I will raise this body again in three days. What, what's he, what does that mean? What's he claiming? He's God. And people said, Jesus never said he was God. He said it over and over. Just because he didn't say the words, I am God, Although he did. I mean, I don't know what else I and the Father are one mean, but okay. But he says it lots of times. That's why they tried to kill him many times, because he kept claiming to be God. Okay, so questions. I'm not asking you for questions. I'm saying learn to ask questions. Ask as many questions as you can. Uh, my sisters call me. Bad timing, sis. Sorry, I'll give you a call back. 
So, uh, you know, the basic who, what, when, where, and how, uh, what, uh, what questions do you have immediately as you're reading the text, surface questions versus deep questions. What's a surface question? What's an example of a surface question? Yeah, what's your favorite color? So when you're reading the Bible, what's a surface question? And that's okay, you should ask these. But like, Jesus is having a, uh, a conversation with the, we said in John 4, right? Jesus is having a conversation with the Samaritan woman. Where? At what well? At Jacob's well. Might want to go back in Genesis and read up on Jacob's well. Okay, why is that important? This is important. There's no random little details. Jacob's well is very important. And you have to ask, where is Jacob's well? What is Jacob's well? What did that represent? Where did it come from? It's, and, 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 and then when you look, you understand better the conversation that Jesus is having with this woman and the significance of him talking to a woman in the first place. This was a big deal. Yeah, do you have to go to a commentary to see that that was a big deal? No. How do you know it's a big deal then without a commentary? Because the disciples are horrified that he's talking to a woman. They're like, I can't believe it. So what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Okay. So you don't, th this is what I mean by learning to pay attention to the text, answering questions from the text. You don't need a commentary to know that that was a no-no because the text is telling you, is yelling it at you. His disciples were horrified. This was not normal. This was something weird and strange and not normal that he was doing simply talking to this woman. Okay, um, facts and meaning, you know, questions about facts and, and, and meaning. We already just mentioned many of those. And then what would this mean to the original audience? This is an important question. This is a very important question. What could this have meant to the original audience? So a lot of times we're reading stuff. So I, I've been using John, so I'll just stay in John. So John 6, he's talking and, you know, he, he, he feeds the 5,000 and then he starts talking to them about you know the, the manna from heaven and, and so forth and the true bread that comes from heaven and you know my father gave this and and but but I'm the true bread that comes I am the bread of life and so on and so forth. He's, he's having this conversation with them and and then he says unless you and then he starts talking crazy unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you 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 won't you ain't gonna have any part you won't even know you won't you won't get me unless you do this and they're all like whoa well, dude, that, oh, come on, okay. And then his own disciples are like, oh, oh, dude, man. And then and he said, what? But then Jesus, you know, he says, what? Do you want to leave too? Now, he's not trying to cheat people, right? Do you want to leave too? And then he gives a brilliantly loving, full of faith answer. Well, man, I don't got nobody else to go to. <laughs> Only you got the words of life, so I guess, I guess we're stuck, you know. <laughs> but, but what do you think that's about? And what 
he was telling the people, because they would never have understood. That, that doesn't make sense. Right? It, it, it's like if, if, I were, if I were to tell you, you know, um, to the right. No, to the right. Definitely not to the left. To the right. Unless you go to the right, you will never get there. You have no know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you have no clue what I'm talking about. And that's the same thing he could not have meant to you. So this is a, and it's very important thing to pay attention to when you're reading. What would the original readers have been able to understand? What would have this meant to them? And it always would have meant something to them. So when you're reading Revelation, he's not talking about helicopters and napalm and you know, Osama bin Laden. He's not talking about that. Because that would have no. Uh, because, because, because that would have meant nothing to his original hearers or his original readers. Does that make sense? And it sounds simple, but we do that all the time. We read it and we, we, we assume that it means, you know, whatever we think it means. But we're reading, it's like, oh, he's, he's talking about the, 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 the best, you know, that the evangelist, you know, uh, uh, direct the, the Sunday service and, and, and not have the, the, the children's ministry. So pay attention and ask the question, what would this mean to the original audience? And then what do I learn about God, humanity, and the world? This is a good set of questions to ask about anything you read in the Bible, because you always can. What did I learn about God? What, what do I learn about God? What, oh, because it's recording. I apologize. Oh. No. Oh, I do? Did not... Oh, I see. I just have more questions. Oh, context. Sorry. Just what we've been talking about. You're not missing anything. Um, so what do I learn about God? What do I learn about humanity in general or myself? C because, you know, hopefully you're human. And then what do you learn about the world? And when I say the world, I'm talking about the world as in uh, the, the systems and ways of thought of the world. Okay, what do I learn about these things? And anything you read in the Bible will teach you about one or even all of these kinds of things. But it's thinking about it, it's paying attention, it's asking the question. And so you're reading about, I don't know, give, give me a random passage or, or, or a story or account in the Bible. Parting of the Red Sea. Parting of the Red Sea. So what does the parting of the Red Sea teach you about God? God's powerful. God's awesome. God protects his people. God always has a plan. God looks out for, I can go on and on and on, right? But it's, there's, there's stuff in there about God. Ask and look and notice what it's telling you about God. What does it tell you about people? What happened? They got there, and what, what did the, how did the people react when they got to the Red Sea? They were afraid. They were doubtful. They were fearful. They didn't, they started dogging Moses. Ah, you brought us here to die. And they kept saying that a lot. But you know, this is one of those times. You brought us here to die. You brought us all this way to kill us. Where are we gonna? They didn't just stop and go in prayer or whatever. What did it tell you about Moses though? What how did Moses react? He reacted with faith. How? He said, he prayed. God will, God will provide, God will do this, God will make a way. And God did. Moses didn't know any more than the rest of them. God didn't say, Moses, go up to the Red Sea and I'll part of the Red Sea. He didn't know, man. He just said, go. And they got to the Red Sea. And he hadn't told Moses anything when everybody started yelling at him. But he still had trust in God. He had faith in God. He said, okay, God, God's going to handle it. And God did handle it. What else does it tell you about people? People need a leader. People need a leader sometimes. It, it helps to have a leader. And what does it tell you about leaders? Leaders aren't perfect. They don't need to have all the answers. They do need to trust. And they need to do something. <laughs> and they need to communicate. They need to communicate. The reason that people need a leader, then what did they need in the leader? They needed reassurance. They needed comfort. They needed help. They needed to have their faith built up. 
in the desert before Moses had to get an answer. Because he didn't know what to do. He didn't have the answer. But he expected to get answers. He trusted that he would have answers. And so when the answers came, he was ready for them and he was able to act. And the people did what? Follow. Did that say, what did that say for the people to follow? Moses into the Red Sea. Trust and faith and so forth. And they believed God. Now, it's kind of easy to believe God when he's just part of the Red Sea. But hey, but still, you know, they believed God. It still took trust and courage and, 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 and risk for them to do that. Okay? Especially when we just saw the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago. And, you know, when, when Pharaoh's army started rushing in after them. It was, and they're, they're, they haven't even gotten to the end yet. It's like, their horse is coming. That was really good. Okay. I, I'm sorry to the sound guys and to the recording people. I keep moving away from the mic. Usually when I speak, if you guys have one next time, I usually use a cordless mic because I'm very uh, peripatetic. I like wandering around. Okay, so uh, what I learned about God, humanity, the world, and then also asking, how does this relate to Jesus? So Red Sea, how does it relate to Jesus? Well, Paul related it to Jesus. How did Paul relate it to Jesus? Do you remember? Said, just like they were baptized in the Red Sea, y'all have been baptized into Christ. Paul found a way to relate it to Jesus. Okay, so we should be doing the same thing. All right. Uh, okay, when you're reading, read carefully, including all the footnotes. Pay close attention to the text itself. Don't try, really try not to make assumptions. Just look at what the text says. You're going to be tired of me saying this. Every time, every time I stand in front of you, I'm going to be saying, pay attention. Or if I ask you to read something and I ask a question, because I do that. You might have noticed. I ask you questions. But I might ask you a question and you'll be given. This, this happens all the time. It probably happens in your Bible talks, right? You're sitting there reading something and your Bible talk leader goes, hey, so, you know, um, what did Jesus say to this, you know, young ruler? And like, well, you know, he would, he would tell them that, you know, he didn't pay taxes, that, you know, he won't get in trouble because, you know, the, it's like, well, no, w what does it say in the text? But pay what, does it, what does it actually say there? Because people, people say all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and they're telling you what they think, what they feel, how they react. It's like, no, no, no. What does the text say? Because you can't, you can't apply it until you've actually read it. <laughs> so just, just, that's, that's free. Okay, so... <laughs> Keep on asking yourself, what does it actually say? And then when you think you understand, go back and say, well, does what I think, is that actually in there? Does that, is that what it says? Again, that sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how little we actually do that. All right, and then finally, finally, now if there's some extra stuff that you don't understand, you can do some research, you can look it up in other kinds of things for those little factoid things. Then you can look in the commentary. I'm telling you, though, look in the commentary last. After you've done everything else, thought about it, read the text 18 times, gone forward, back, discussed it with your friends and family, walked up to the guy sitting in the, in, in the Waffle House and said, hey, I'm reading this. What does this mean? What do you think this means? And everything like that. Great. All right. All right. You want to keep reading? Great. All right. All right. Okay. Well, I'll baptize you next week. And then you can, you can keep, you can have all those discussions first and then, and only then, open a commentary. And what you will find, if you practice reading, if you practice all the things that you're going to learn, what you will find is, by the time, eventually, at some point, by the time you go to commentaries, you will be saying, yeah, I already knew that. Oh yeah, well, yeah, of course, well, that's true. Oh wait, that's actually not right, what that guy said in the commentary. That, that's not what the text says. Why? Because you will know what the text says. That, that, that's where I want to get you guys, where you know what the text says. Where when you're, when, when you're studying the Bible with someone and they say, well, you know, it says, it says right here. You know, I mean, right here. That you're saved by faith alone. It's like, where does it say that? It says you're saved by faith alone? Alone? It doesn't say it. That is nowhere in the Bible. There's only one passage in the Bible where faith and alone appear together, and guess what it says? You are not saved by faith alone. It's in James. <laughs> Crazy, right? That's just the Bible, though. 
Okay, so just to go over and review, what kind of writing is this? You know, what situation is this a part of? What's the big picture? What's the bird's eye view? What questions do I have about the text? And remember, if you don't have questions, you're not, it's not the Bible you're reading, or you're not really reading it. And then read slowly and carefully, multiple versions. Pay close attention to what the text actually says. Notice, that's in bold. Make as few assumptions as possible, just trying to, under, you're trying to understand what it's telling you. You can start thinking and assuming and wondering later, but what is it actually saying now? What do, and, and, and then, at the end of everything, after you think you have a really good understanding, then you can look at outside resources just to brush up, just to find out, just to see what technical term you want to know. Okay, well, you know where do the Pharisees come from anyway, and you know how do how do you how do you pronounce Melchizedek and you know, all that kind of stuff. So you can do all that later. But right now, if you say Milkabug, that's okay. Milkabug, it is. You don't need to know how to pronounce it to understand that it's a guy, and that's who they're talking about, right? Later on, you can say, "Oh, Melchizedek." Okay, that's good. That, now it works. All right, questions. What questions do you have? I'm asking you for questions. <laughs> about the stuff that we talked about. Like, what are you wondering? Yes. Oh, I, I didn't, that's not quite what I said. Yeah, I don't know if you heard my whole, my, I developed that. Yeah, I, I developed that. I, 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 said, it, I said, if you have a question about the Bible, most of the time you can find the answer in the Bible, and if you cannot, it's probably not answerable. And if you look at outside resources to find the answer, you ain't gonna find a real one or a good one because if, it can't, if you can't answer from the Bible, that means that you can't really answer it. Right, so, and I use the example of the baptism for the dead. Nobody knows what that was. But you know, you can see how Paul was using it. And Paul, it didn't matter what it was. Paul was saying, you guys do something that we don't understand that involves baptism and dead people. Why do you do that if you don't believe in the resurrection? Because there were people around saying, out of resurrection, they were saying, it, it happened already and you missed it. Uh, there's no such thing as a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And some Sadducees beca had become Christians, right? And so they said, there's no such thing as resurrection. You can't come back to life again. No, blah, blah. There were all kinds of weird and false teachings floating around. Paul was making the point. This is 1 Corinthians 15, where he's talking about the resurrection. He, starts with, he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. He says, if you don't believe this, your faith is in vain. It's useless. You might as well not be a Christian. You, everything you've done and sacrificed and lived and believed in your life is worthless if you don't believe in the resurrection. Because if you don't believe in the resurrection, that means Jesus wasn't even resurrected. If you don't believe Jesus was, res uh, was resurrected, you don't believe he was the son of God because he was shown to be the son of God by being resurrected. So you don't believe anything that means anything about Jesus if you don't believe the resurrection. And furthermore, you have no hope. The hope of the Christian is that we will be resurrected like he was, is that we'll be walking around eating fish on the beach like Jesus was, is that we will be bodily resurrected in a new body that won't die anymore. That's the hope that we have as Christians. That's, by the way, that one hope in Ephesians 4, that's what it is, in case you were wondering what the one hope was. The one hope is the hope of, of, of resurrection. And so this is what he's talking about in this chapter, and he says, if you don't believe this, why are you baptizing for dead people? Now we don't, need, again, do, do you need to know what, it, we don't need to know what it was, he's just saying you do, you're, you guys are doing something that implies that you believe in a resurrection. Why would you do that? Like, why baptize for dead people unless you thought that the dead people were gonna benefit somehow? Right? But, but we don't know exactly what baptism for the dead was. That's the only place it's mentioned, not just in the Bible, period. Every other mention of it in ancient literature is people wondering what it meant. <laughs> How's what? 
it's, it's usually not very important. So the un when I say not very important, it's not very important that we, that we have an answer. So for that one, it's, it's actually not important because he's using it rhetorically and you can see how he's using it and you can still make sense of how he's using it to understand what he's saying. Now, let's take something like the Trinity. Okay, now the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the Bible clearly states that God the Father is God. The Bible absolutely states over and over and over again that Jesus, the Son, the incarnate Word of God, is God. The Bible absolutely says that the Holy Spirit of God is God. The Bible also makes it crystal clear that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is neither of them. But they're all God. And the Bible absolutely, Old and New Testament, manifestly proclaims, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God, period. My, my favorite line in that movie, right? There's only one God, ma'am. <laughs> and he's not it. <laughs> he's not him. Um, in uh, Captain America or whatever, Avengers with Loki. Loki's, I'm a God, there's only one God, and you're not him. But uh, <laughs> there's only one God. So the Bible says that Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. Now, how that works, we don't know. How it all fits together, we don't know. Why it is, we don't know. And I don't know that we can know. But does it, does it really matter? That want, we we want to know because we're made to want to know. That curiosity is part of what it means to be human. But does it change your life to know? If you knew exactly how that worked, would that be, so what? <laughs> right? You don't need to know that. But you do need to know that there's a that. And, and, and that we know. It's important that Jesus is God. It's important that the Spirit's God. It's important that the Father's God. And the relationship that they have with one another is also important. But you, can, you know that, and you can understand that. And the fact when John says, God is love, God literally is love. God exists as a loving relationship between three persons within his own nature of in, 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 in so much unity that there's only one God. Right? So that's important. But you can understand that. Without knowing how it works, you can understand that it works. Ah, but then Jesus says, I'm praying, not just for you guys, my disciples sitting here with me, but I'm praying for everyone that believes without having seen me. I'm praying for everyone who will ever come to believe in me. This is, this is us, right, that he's praying for. And what does he say? I pray that they may be, what? Oh, yeah, but that's just like generically, right? We should just be, uh, that they may be one just as we are one. Right. Now, now it's getting deep. Now the how is starting to matter. But we're not told the how. But we are told the why. And so it's important. So does that, that help? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, sometimes that's all you can do. Yeah. Right.
That's a very good uh, way of, in, of thinking of it, interpreting it. That, that, is, that, is, that is in fact plausible. The, the point being made about that though is we don't know what it meant, but that's very plausible. That, may, that makes sense, that's a good way of thinking of it that helps you to understand the text. That, that's plausible. Okay, uh, one more and then, and then we're done. Yes? Uh, do, do I recommend reading the Bible from what to what? Oh, uh, straight through? Yeah, if, um, over time, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to do, do that over the weekend, but yeah, uh, you, 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 you definitely, I, I mentioned something about that earlier. You do want to read through the Bible, but you can do it in a natural way. You don't have to, like, you know, read the Bible in a year. There's, there's no reason you have to arbitrarily read it in any given period of time. That might be motivating to help you to read it, but just read it. Just start reading. So, like, you know, if, if you're reading, I, I do think if you're going to pick some things to read, to read first, I would absolutely read the first five books. They are foundational. You cannot understand, really understand anything in the rest of the Bible without understanding the first five books, without you know, having a good, solid grasp on the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then I would recommend reading, and you can read this at the same time, right? I re highly recommend reading Psalms frequently and often and being very familiar with Psalms. Why? Because this was the prayer book for the Jews and this was Jesus' prayer book. When Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament, the places he relied on heavily were the first five books, the Torah. He's a Jewish, so the Torah. Um, he relied heavily on Psalms, and he relied heavily on the prophets, especially Isaiah. Okay, so Isaiah is another one that you want to be familiar with, and Isaiah is kind of big. But ultimately, you want to read all of them. You want to read the whole Bible, but again, if you're going to start someplace, definitely that first five books. You'll get the most bang for your buck because you'll see that coming over and over again. Everything else you read, you'll begin to understand. You'll begin to understand in, 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 um, the, in the prophets when they're talking about Ephraim, right? When they're talking about Ephraim and Judah, you can see, okay, you'll understand why Ephraim is a nickname for Israel and what that means and why. You'll be able to see later that Israel, the United Kingdom, split into a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. And that's why later prophets were addressing two different countries, but they were both the people of God because they were split from the same people of God, right? You then begin to understand in the New Testament when they're talking about gathering the scattered, the remnant, the, what, what is this remnant? Where is that coming? You have to read the Old Testament to know what the remnant is. And when you understand what that remnant was, then you know how Paul is applying it in Romans 9 through 11. So all the, like I said, anything you read will help you to understand anything else that you read. But if you read those first five books first, you'll, get, you'll, you'll, get a, you, you'll be surprised how much you get out of it. And when Jesus was teaching, all of his teaching came from the Old Testament. He wasn't making stuff up. He, he wasn't making things up. He was telling people what God had always said. But he was tell, he was, they had already messed up what God was saying, and he was correcting their thinking. He said, look, you guys say this, but let me tell you what I meant when I told it to you in the first place. And then he would, you know, tell them what he meant. So that's it. Uh, I, I said we're done, so you can just talk to me afterwards. So I'll, I'll just come up and talk to you right now. And, I'll just tell you, because it wouldn't be fair to everyone. I already said that was the last question. Sorry, got to be fair. So thank you. See you all next month.